Hello and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios of our flagship stations, 89.3 Lakes FM and Civic Center TV. In addition today, as always, we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Our TV stations are Comcast, Channel 15, and AT&T, Channel 99. We're also on the radio in the greater West Bloomfield area on 89.3 Lakes FM and in the Birmingham and Bloomfield area on 88.1 WBFH. The Biff. Also online, civiccentertv.com. Click on our Watch Live link or view us in that small player at the top right of our homepage on your web browser, on your laptop or desktop computer. And of course, on social media, as always, on our Facebook pages, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. And today, joining me in the studio in place of Ronnie Dahl is Erica Jones. Hey Tyler, good to be here again. Like I was saying yesterday when I was doing my mic check, I hate that it's at the expense of some of our good friends here, but I'm getting all these opportunities now. Yeah, you know, it's uh, you get called out every now and then, you're gonna get called out of the bullpen this summer. And uh, you know, you've made that analogy last week uh, on your second show of, of two. And uh, you know, we had uh, Ronnie call this morning and said she needed to take the day for, for personal reasons. And so you know, I called you up and, it's, and you're good to go. Works out, right? Happy to be here. Absolutely. It does work out well, and it's good to have multiple people on our, on our team that can file in when one of us needs to go out for the day or, or take a day to ourselves. So, a lot to get to on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We've got an interesting slew of guests, and of course, all of our usual headlines online at civiccentertv.com. Before we go into those, let's go into a little more of where you can find all these vast resources that we provide to you here at Civic Center TV. Of course, at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, you can find links to reputable resources regarding COVID-19 and other public health information from the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, and Oakland County, as well as many of our local municipalities. In addition to that, you'll also find articles that are uh, atop the headlines each and every day here in our local area. Also on our website on civiccentertv.com slash megacast, in case you miss any of our programming here, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. You can find full episodes and, and full interviews of the show as well. So if you don't have those two hours to join us each and every day, you, or you just want to listen to specific people talking about specific topics. So for example, we'll have Jim Francis from the Michigan DNR with us later on in the 10 o'clock hour this morning. And if you are really interested in fishing, but don't want to listen to all the other topics or watch the other all the other uh, interviews that we were having here on the show, you can just find that interview on our website. Those are usually uploaded sometime in the late afternoon here at Civic Center TV. In addition, you can find more information on all of our partnering TV and radio stations as well and enjoy their programming throughout the day also as not only are we providing daily programming to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week as well as online, so do our partners at 88.1 WBFH, The Biff and Birmingham area municipal access. But of course, the most important thing of the day on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus is our daily headlines. I'm making news today, COVID-19 vaccinations are now going to be required for Henry Ford Health System employees. This is from the Oakland Press. Being vaccinated against COVID-19 will be a condition of employment at Henry Ford Health System beginning on September 10th of this year. Quote, we believe we are the first healthcare system in Michigan to mandate vaccination. Nationally, we are aware that over 18 healthcare systems are required or in the process of requiring vaccination for their employees, and we anticipate that numbers will continue to grow. That from Bob Riney, Henry Ford's president of healthcare operations and chief operating officer, said, which was said at a virtual press conference that took place yesterday. The decision applies to all team members, medical staff, students, volunteers, and contractors that will do business in the Henry Ford facilities, including employees who work remotely or those who have had COVID-19. Exemptions will be granted, however, for people with medical or religious reasons why they cannot or should not be vaccinated against COVID-19. Another quote from Bob Riney from Henry Ford Health System, quote, with COVID-19 hospitalizations in the single digits at each of our hospitals and the positivity rate hovering about 1% statewide, we are optimistic that the worst is behind us, he said, but we have, we have lived this fight long enough to know that variants are real and worrisome. They will continue to emerge and surges can happen anytime, anywhere, in closed quote. Employees who have antibodies will also still be required 
to be vaccinated because it offers more protection against variants such as the uh, current variant that's sweeping the world right now, the, the, the Delta variant. Science and data has proven that safety and effectiveness of the vaccine and finally says that he expects the FDA to grant permanent approval to the vaccines. Quote, no question in my mind that every person who walks through our doors will find some comfort knowing that, no, that their team members, their team care providers and everyone they come into contact with are vaccinated against COVID-19 and closed quote. That is from actually from Dr. Dennis Cunningham, Henry Ford's system, health system director of infection control and prevention. Currently 68% or about 23,000 of the 33,000 Henry Ford health system team members are vaccinated about 90% of the physicians fall in that category, which matches the national average noted by the American Medical Association. So this is the first of what I would expect to be many different healthcare institutions and other employment institutions as well that will likely require their employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19. We recently had an employment attorney on the show that did say that that is something that is permitted, that the companies do have the ability to require vaccinations as a term of employment. And uh, what, what I've also found interesting in this article was that uh, those that have had COVID-19 and have the antibodies are going to also be required to have COVID-19 vaccinations for the extra protection. They're really just going as far as they can, Henry Ford Health System is, to prevent any spread of COVID-19 in their hospitals. As we've seen many times before, it's been a worrisome situation for these hospitals when there have been surges, when variants have taken their taken hold in their communities. And so uh, a lot of precaution here, but I'm sure that there's gonna be a great mixed reaction from employees in the Henry Ford Health System. Yeah, definitely. I think there's going to be a mixed reaction. And whenever I hear mandated vaccines, I know different universities have even done that. My school hasn't done that. It could still happen. Not sure yet, but I always wonder how strict that mandate will really be. And of course, like you discussed in the article, there are religious reasons and health reasons where people might have to opt out of that. But I would think that a healthcare system would be more strict about those opt outs and mandate them a lot more than maybe a university where a student could just bring in a note or really anyone could just say that it's a religious or health reason and there's nothing to really check that but it'll be interesting to see how at a healthcare system they go about that because I would think like I said it's going to be much more strict at a hospital than it would be at a university or another type of employment that mandates it. Yeah and it's, what's also interesting to note here is that it's not just direct employees of Henry Ford Health System this is also going to affect Henry Ford Health Systems partners as well as their contractors and, and others that are coming in and doing business, including volunteers at the hospital, many other hospitals, including Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital, have a mass of volunteers that are working there each and every day. And all of those people are also going to be required to be vaccinated against COVID-19. So it really is a lockdown against COVID there at, the, uh, at Henry Ford Health System. And it's many uh, different facilities. The good news with this is that this requirement is not immediate. So it's not something that that it's going to be that should necessarily be an immediate worry for anybody that is an employee or a contractor or a volunteer at Henry Ford Health System. They do have some time should they still be adamant about not being vaccinated to to find other to seek other employment or seek other opportunities or maybe even reconsider getting vaccinated and, and have some more consultation on that from medical experts, from family and, and religious institutions, whoever they decide to consult as this requirement, as is noted in the, this Oakland Press article on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus does not go into effect until September 10th. Also making headlines, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus this 4th of July weekend, a lot of people are going to be out on the lakes here in the local area. It's going to be, a, it looks like so far, it's going to be a very nice 4th of July weekend. But be aware, extra deputies from our Oakland County Sheriff's Department will be on patrol over the holiday weekend. This is from the Detroit News. Extra sheriff's deputies will be patrolling Oakland County lakes over the July 4 holiday period as a part of a national campaign aimed at reducing alcohol and drug-related accidents and fatalities on bodies of water. Operation Dry Water was launched in 2009 by the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators in partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard and local, state, and federal law enforcement. Oakland County to the north and northwest of Detroit has 450 navigable lakes and 83,000 
registered boats, according to the sheriff's office. The county's marine unit has 13 full-time deputies trained in dive and emergency rescue. It also has more than 45 part-time marine deputies who respond to lake emergencies, 23 patrol boats, two rapid response jump boats, one hovercraft, six all-terrain vehicles, and three specialty boats for search and rescue emergencies. A lot of different lakes of a lot of various sizes uh, here in, in, uh, in areas of various terrain here in Oakland County. And a lot of people are going to be out on the water. And this is a busy time of the year as it is. And the holiday, these holiday weekends are usually very busy. And coming out of a pandemic, in, in some terms, coming out of a pandemic, you would expect that traffic to be even higher. And, you know, sometimes people are having a good time. It's a long weekend for a lot of people. They're out having a lot of fun. They're maybe not being as responsible. And that's one of the many reasons for this extra patrol unit you know, out there. So just another reminder for the people here in, in our local area to be safe and be smart so that you don't have a, a negative interaction with, with our sheriff's department out there on the waters this holiday season. Yeah, it's no secret, especially in an area like this with all the lakes and people going out on boats, that a lot of people like to use holidays like the 4th of July for an excuse to have the day off, go get drunk on the water, and especially with, uh, you know, last year. I don't even remember where I was on 4th of July last year, but I'm sure I was at home doing nothing, as most of us were. So now a year later that it is a little... Uh, more available to us to be able to go out on boats and do stuff like that. I would think that people are even more so going to want to take advantage of that and make up for that lost time, if you will. So it is sure to be a crazy weekend, but hopefully we can somewhat help enforce people to stay safe out there because people need to hear that and not forget that just because we are able to go back out, that doesn't mean that we should just let loose and forget how to be safe. And even still, there are COVID concerns. Right. And on top of that, when you're out on a boat on the, on the lake on any on any weekend, you're not the only p kind of people that are out there. There are people that are out there swimming. There are people that are out there not necessarily on motor boats or on high-powered boats. They're out there just canoeing or they're going out there and they're fishing. And you need to be aware of that because the spacing between these vehicles is critical, especially in times of emergencies. If you need to take ev evasive action to avoid an accident. And you want to be cognizant of other people and their enjoyment as well. So a lot of different reasons why. Uh, Operation Dry Water is going to be in effect here for the Oakland County Sheriff's Department this holiday weekend with extra enforcement out on Oakland County's 450 nav navigable lakes, as noted in this article from the Detroit News. Some good news, Mich 44 Michigan counties have no activity, but virus cases, unfortunately, in that case, continue to persist. This from the Oakland Press. The coronavirus cases and death counts continue to, to mount, but more than half of Michigan's counties have no new cases or deaths. There were just 173 new cases and 32 deaths, 27 from vital, record, vital records reviews that were announced on Tuesday by the state health department, but no new cases or deaths in 44 of the state of Michigan's 83 counties. The larger daily numbers continue to be in the southeast and southwest portions of the state of Michigan. There were 43 cases and three deaths in Wayne County, 14 cases and one death in Macomb County, eight cases and three deaths in the city of Detroit, which reports separately, and eight cases and two deaths here in Oakland County. In West Michigan, there were 17 cases and three deaths in Kent County, 15 cases in Ottawa County, and in mid-Michigan, Clare County had one death in Gratiot County, also with just one case. Vaccination levels statewide of residents ages 12 or older are at about 50 percent, ranging from a low in Detroit of slightly more than 31 percent to a high of more than 71 percent in Leelanau County in the northern Lower Peninsula. More than 60 percent of residents over 50 years old have been vaccinated and vaccination rates are higher with older age groups. Younger age groups are increasingly acquiring vaccinations including 21 percent in the 12 to 15 uh, age group. Even with more normal economic and social conditions compared to a year ago, the state health department says it has no plans to halt daily updates of COVID-19 cases and deaths, as well as the vaccination rates. As this information continues to be critical as we are heading into a period where uh, we're in the busy seasons of the year as in terms of tourism, people are getting out, the weather is nice, a lot of people are interacting, 
uh, it's been 15, 16 months since everybody has really been able to live a normal life socially. And so a lot of people are clamoring to get back out there. And so with that, there's going to be more spread of COVID-19. It's going to continue to happen. And then you have, of course, the, the uh, big variable here is the Delta variant, which has been spreading uh, throughout the world. It's, of course, been absolutely horrible in places like the United Kingdom and especially in India. And vaccination here in the U.S. is uh, one of the one of the stronger protections against being a, a victim of the delta variant of covid 19 so we're going to continue to track all these metrics and see where the state is going with the with these numbers and hopefully continue it, can, it continues to trend positive not in case numbers but positive uh in terms of outlook here in the state of michigan yeah definitely and i'm the first to admit i am a little bit naive sometimes when it comes to this stuff. So I don't want to speak on anything I'm not sure of, but I think you might know better than I do that it has been said by our medical experts that the vaccines we already have here in the U.S. do protect us against the new Delta variant. Is that correct? Yeah, they did say that that uh, the Delta variant has not so far shown to be overpowering these vaccines, that they are helpful against the Delta variant. So uh, that's another reason why they're continuing to push these vaccinations. It was actually it was noted in our first article today about Henry Ford Health System requiring COVID-19 vaccinations for employees, for volunteers, for contractors, and so on, that they, uh, they, they are concerned about variants such as the Delta variant and others that will also emerge in the coming months as, you know, even here in the U.S., as, as things are looking up and up about vaccinations and things are starting to open back up to somewhat of normalcy. Other places in the world, vaccination rates are nowhere near where they're at in the United States or where they were at in the United States several months ago. And so variants are more likely to pop up there than they are here. And they're going to spread throughout the world as more economies open up as well. So uh, the Delta variant is still a great concern to the health community. And that's why uh, they continue to push vaccinations. And we'll probably see more companies and more massive organizations such as Henry Ford Health System move toward requiring vaccinations for their employees and for others involved as well. You can find all those headlines and more on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. In addition, you'll find helpful resources from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, as well as many of our local municipalities that will give you direct information about COVID-19 so you don't have to go ahead and search the CDC and navigate their website to find specifics on COVID-19. You just go to civiccentertv.com, you click on a coronavirus link, you click on the CDC resources and just like that, it brings you directly to their COVID-19 information page that has the most up-to-date information right there for you, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. With that, we're going to take a quick break here on the Megacast. We got a lot of great things coming up for you on today's edition of the show. Here in the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to be joined in just a few minutes by Jim Francis from the Michigan Department of uh, Natural Resources or the DNR. Later on in the 10 o'clock hour, we'll be joined by the Executive Director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. And then to kick off the 11 o'clock hour, we'll be joined by one of the new assistant superintendents in the West Bloomfield School District as he begins uh, a new chapter in his career during a time where education is constantly changing and will continue to evolve. That coming up next here on the Oakland County Megacast, we will return after this quick break. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking 
longer amounts of time to respond. Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft alongside Erica Jones in our flagship studios here at Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM here on the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV, radio, online, and social media uh, outlets as well. Well, uh, summer is here where it's in full effect. Of course, we've had some bad weather over the last couple of weeks, a whole lot of rain, but other water that we enjoy a little bit more is out on our lakes here in the state of Michigan where we have a excellent fi an excellent collection of, of fishing opportunities here as well. And joining us to talk more about that, we are pleased to be joined now by Jim Francis from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Jim is their Lake Erie Basin Coordinator with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Jim, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Tyler and Erica. Yeah, good to have you here. Good to have you with us. Uh, how are you doing and how are things going over at the Michigan Department of Natural Resources? It's going well. And, and like you said, it was kind of interesting. I think a week ago we were looking at drought conditions in southeast Michigan. A lot of our lakes and streams were at extremely low levels. And uh, I think we made up for it and got our, our uh, season's worth of rain in about five days here. So playing catch up here pretty quick. But um, but yeah, it's 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 changes over time for sure. So so with that, and, and just to kind of, well, we're here to talk mostly about fishing today, but yeah. the flooding is a major issue here in the state of Michigan. The, the situation with the massive amount of rain that we've received here in just the last week is, is obviously top of everybody's mind. And of course our thoughts are with those that have been severely affected by the floods down, mostly in, in our local area, down river, but also just all throughout the state of Michigan. So Jim, w with that, with the amount of rain that we got, like you said, you, you put it in terms of saying, and this may not be exact, uh, you know, a year's worth of rain in, in a week here, a season's worth of rain in, the, in a week here. How does that affect our waterways, like our lakes and our streams and our rivers and, and, and their recovery coming out of a, a storm system like we've seen over last weekend and into this week? Yeah, it's interesting, um, you know, in, in especially down here in Southeast Michigan in an urban environment, so we've got a lot of impervious surfaces, meaning rooftops and pavement and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, if those impervious surfaces aren't there, the rainwater has an opportunity to infiltrate. So that certainly helps. But but again, uh, with the conditions that we saw, I mean, the, the massive amounts of rain we saw, even that's difficult and you're going to experience some type of flooding. But but certainly, um, you know, how we how we manage that infrastructure is important as well. And as far as the fisheries, it really, you know, they've, they've evolved in that type of environment. So they see those conditions and, and uh, that doesn't really have too much impact on the fishery itself. With those, ma with the massive amounts of flooding too, Jim, you, you see that it's not just water from necessarily storm, storm drainage that's overflowing. It's also things like sewer systems. It's also runoff from people's yards, especially in, in affecting waterways when they live close to a river or a pond or a lake or so on and so forth. How does that, how is that maybe, is there a concern at the DNR about the impact of pollution to these waterways because of so much runoff that may be going into these waterways because of our recent rain? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and certainly, um, you know, we want to make sure that that, you know, chemicals and other pollutants don't get into the system. Um, you know, when you have conditions like this, certainly you get a big flush and some of that does happen. What we see, though, is that it does, it typically doesn't cause a problem, at least for the fisheries perspective. I mean, certainly from the human health perspective, if, if you have E. coli and, and other types of bacteria contamination, that's a concern. But um, from a fisheries perspective, it doesn't really 
affect them much. And, and because you have, it's kind of that whole dilution factor. You've got massive amounts of rain, so it flushes it and clears it pretty quick as well. So that, that really diminishes any potential impact on, on environmental conditions as well. So in terms of fishing, if people are fishing for food, they're not fishing necessarily for catch and release, they're going to catch and then eventually cook these fish. Does the DNR have any concerns with what you said? There's there being not really much of a large concern or risk regarding E. coli. Would you say that this is currently a safe time for people that are catching to eat fish across our waterways in the state of Michigan, especially in particularly in flooded area in areas that have been affected by the flooding? Is it safe for them for people uh, who are fishing to catch these fish and eat these fish or should they wait a little while uh, until that has maybe flood out, flooded um, flowed, no pun intended, flowed out of our uh, water systems? Yeah, we don't we don't have any concerns there. Um, you know, with with chemical exposure to fish, there needs to be um, you know a certain amount of exposure time. And again, with a with an event like this, it, it's really not an issue. It flushes through. So so no, when we have an event like this, it really doesn't have any impact on on consumption advisories. And we do put consumption advisories because there are certain chemicals that do affect that. Um, and that's you know we we monitor that on a regular basis. But this is just a short term, um, it's, it's not going to have any impact. So I'm looking down here at my notes and I have some stuff about a fishing license, but I've always just thought you want to go fishing, you go out and go fishing, aside from if you're maybe somewhere else that has really deep sea fishing. So tell me about having a fishing license more so in Michigan and what you can do with one that a person like myself who would just go out maybe recreationally could not do. Yeah, so so um, in Michigan, it, at 17 years of age is when you need a fishing license. So if you're younger than than 17, um, you know, so parents can take young children out, and that's not a problem. They're they're legal to fish, um, but once you turn 17, you should have a fishing license. And you know, you talk about the opportunities. We 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 often term our resources here in Michigan as world class, and and it's it's awesome because it's number one. It's 365 days a year. You can use it whenever you want. Um, and just the diversity of the fisheries as well. We've got, I mean, from trout, salmon, muskie, walleye, perch, panfish. I mean, the, the diversity is pretty impressive. Um, you know, 11,000 lakes, 30,000 miles of rivers, four of the Great Lakes. It's it's just a really impressive fishery. And I, you know, I'm, I might have a biased opinion, but to me, it's the best value out there for 26 bucks. You can go out there and, and fish, you know, every day of the year and, and some fantastic resources. So I'm, I'm a little biased there, though. We're joined by Jim Francis. He's the Lake Erie Basin Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And, and Jim, w with regard to fishing licenses, uh, you said that they're good all year round. Do they have an expiration? Are they yearly? Do you, are they bi-yearly? Do, do they last for several years? How long do these applic these uh, licenses stay in effect? Yeah, good question. It's an annual license and it doesn't sync up with the calendar year. So April 1 is when new licenses begin and it's, it's good for a full 365 days um and yeah it's uh you can you can get them at you know most sporting goods outlets um walmart myers um the other opportunity is you know with people going digital now they're really easy we've made it really easy to purchase online now if you go to michigan.gov backslash dnr um you can get uh you know just click on click on the link there and it'll take you right to your fishing license and and you'll be all set we're joined by Jim Francis here on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the Lake Erie Basin Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And, and Jim, last summer... Oh, wrong, is, wrong, wrong one, sorry. DNR. Yeah, DNR. <laughs> I'm sorry. So yeah, I'm so no used problem. to saying Health and Human Services. The last few times I've looked down, I've had that in my head, looking down at the Not notes a problem. to, re to recite it. I've looked at my notes specifically to say, <laughs> I'm going to read this word for word so I don't say Health and Human Services. And <laughs> there you go. It's okay. It's basic reading. Jim Francis from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources yeah. with us here on the Oakland County Megacast uh, talking about fishing here in the state of Michigan. And Jim, last summer, uh, as people were trying to have some activity, albeit safe from COVID-19, a lot of people flocked to our natural resources, to our parks, yeah. to our lakes and, and our streams and our rivers. And a lot of people were, got very interested in fishing last year. How did last year's fishing season affect the fish population, if at all, and, and how, if it has had any sort of impact 
on that fish population as the DNR responded to that to, of course, maintain these ecosystems? Yeah, again, good question. Um, yeah, we saw, I mean, clearly it was, it was pandem pandemic related response. Um, we had been seeing in both our hunting and fishing license sales, just a general decline over about the past 15 years. It's just been slowly, slowly trailing off. Um, last year, we saw a big jump in both fishing license and hunting license sales. And I think a lot of it, you know, people had more time on their hands, um, you know, in to avoid the COVID, you know, get outdoors and get some fresh air. So I think that was part of it. But uh, we've seen that in the state of Michigan and also nationally, we're, we're I think on the order of about a 10% increase. And um, we weren't quite sure how that was going to translate this year. You know, April 1 began the new license year. And, you know, was it a one time only now that people are going back to the office or eventually going to be going back to the office? Or are they going to give that up? And, and we're seeing those numbers, that trend continue. So, so an increase in fishing license sales. Um, I think part of it, you know, it was, it was a change of scenery, get outdoors, get some fresh air was certainly part of it. But I think it was just slowing things down too. I mean, people, you know, um, I know for myself, we were working at home and you got more time on your hands. And so maybe going back to some of those hobbies that you kind of gave up over the years and um, are getting back to it. So uh, we haven't seen that translate into any changes in the fish population though. Um, you know, a lot of people, as you talked about earlier, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people go fishing. Um, and, and surprisingly, when we do surveys, one of the biggest reasons they go fishing is just to get away from things for a while. So they're not even necessarily interested in harvesting fish. That's part of it. Some people do like to harvest fish and um, it pr provides good nutrition for people. But a lot of people just want that change of scenery, the solitude, um, just getting away from, from things for a while. Not to turn this into something negative, but with the pandemic, we talk so much lately about mental health and people really mm -hmm. needing that outlet. So how much do you think fishing can provide that for you? Do you think it can be a really good therapeutic activity? Talk to us a little bit about that release that you can get from it. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I don't think there's any question about that. I think, you know, again, just getting that, getting outdoors, getting back into the environment. I think all those have positive benefits and they have actually done some studies where they looked at getting people outdoors and just you know it just the change in mental it you know changes to a positive mental image and um and and there are definitely a lot of uh a lot of positive benefits i know you know personally i've, I've fished my whole life but i i know when i come back from fishing you know i whether whether i caught fish or not i i always have a big smile on my face it just for me personally it's kind of like a reset um and so I, I know a lot of people do get that kind of recharge from getting out and, and just the relaxation and getting back in the environment as well. Both of those play, play a big factor. Jim Francis with us on the Oakland County Megacasta Lake Erie Basin Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources joining us today. And, and Jim, as people are going back out on the waters this summer and they're going out and they're, and they're getting back into fishing, what are some things that maybe are, are new that they should be aware of out on our waters as they begin their summer fishing season? You know, it's, um, there's not a lot. I mean, we've got, uh, we continue to do our stocking program. So this year, um, just last week, we finished harvesting our walleye ponds. And so that's, um, we take the eggs in the spring, we raise them throughout uh, early spring and we stock them in early to mid June. So we, we, we did get our walleye stock this year, which is good news because last year, the pandemic prevented us from, from collecting those eggs and doing that. So we did get all of our lakes stocked again this year. So a lot of them in Oakland County, Cass Lake, Union Lake, White Lake, um, we've got a lot of lakes in the area that, that we stock on a regular basis. So we were able to get those lakes restocked again this year. So um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the fisheries are in really good condition right now. And, and like I said, we we use that term world-class fisheries because we've got, you know, the quality, the diversity and the opportunities um, are, there's, there's great opportunities out there for us. Jim Francis with us from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. He is their Lake Erie Basin Coordinator. And, and Jim, you, you mentioned the biodiversity of fish here in the state of Michigan. There's yeah. so many different fish to go out and aim to, fit, to fish for and so many that you may encounter on our many different waterways here in the state of Michigan. 
Uh, for those that maybe are going out there and this is their first summer or their second summer, and they're still relatively novice fisher, fishermen, uh, what should they be aware of when, when they're going out there, especially when they're fishing to harvest? Because there, there may not be common knowledge of what of identifying certain fish from others, and some maybe may not be the most edible. Yeah, in in so I would again direct people to our our website michigan.gov backslash dnr, and right at the top is a fishing icon. You can click on that. We've got some really good information there because you're right. Um, you know, there's there's hardcore anglers like me that have been doing it for years, and we 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 know what we're doing and where to go and those sorts of things. And but with with the newer people that are recruiting into the into the program now, there might not be that knowledge base. So we've got a lot of really good information on our web page. Um, one of them, for example, we've got it's called Family Friendly Fishing Waters, and you can click on that, and it'll you know buy it shows you a map of the air of the state, and you can click on your area and find kind of low low um, easy access points to get out and take advantage of fishing um, in when you do purchase your fishing license, um, there is also a link to our fishing regulation guide. And there's a lot of really good information in there. Not only does it tell you the, the rules and regulations, but there are in the back, it shows you how to identify fish and um, you know get at some of those, those basic information um, that people might need to, to pick up the sport and, and start getting active in fishing. So of course, Jim, you mentioned earlier that April 1st is the beginning of the fishing season. That's when the uh, year for the annual fishing licenses begins, but people can still pick up their licenses now. You mentioned earlier as well the age requirements for getting a fishing license here in the state of Michigan. Are there any other requirements or any other information that needs to be provided when someone is obtaining a fishing license that they should be aware of before they go to any institution where they can get these licenses? No, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, like I said, the, the DNR website, you can get it there and uh, you just, just create your personal account and you log in and you, you can purchase it with your credit card. So it's uh, nothing special required, just uh, an identification and that'll get you up and running. Jim Francis with us, the Lake Erie Basin Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, joining us today on the Oakland County MAGACast. And Jim, just another couple minutes with you. And as we're sure. heading into one of the busier portions of the year here on, on our lakes and our rivers and our streams, our waterways all throughout the state of Michigan, as people go back out to fish all throughout the summer, I have to ask, because people are going to be on every single one of these waterways. Some are going to be more crowded than the others. What are your three favorite places to fish here in the state of Michigan? Um... I, I got to be careful because, like you said, That's some it. of these are relatively small. I've exactly. got uh, I've got my honey hole for sure. Um, but for me, I, I really part of it depends on what what you're after. And for me, I, I really enjoy boating and, and targeting walleye. So Lake Erie's probably my number one destination. Um, and again, it's it's a, getting a little bit later in the season, but but walleyes on Detroit River is another great opportunity. And I think the third one, I'll just I'll just leave it general. Um, I love to fish panfish, you know, bluegills and sunfish. Um, it's it's pretty low key. It, it's um, you know it's very relaxing, and and where you can do it, we've got tons of opportunities. And, and even right here in Southeast Michigan, um, we've got a really good boating access program. Uh, a lot of our our parks and lakes have really good access, and and all of them have have good fishing opportunities. So. I just leave it general and just say bluegills and, and our inland lakes are there's a lot of great opportunities there. Jim Francis with us. He is the Lake Erie Basin Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And Jim, before we let you go, any other information that would be important for our audience to know or anything else interesting that you'd like to discuss today? No, I think I think we covered a lot of it. Um, again, I, I would just reference our, our website. There's a lot of really good information there. Um, we've got stocking records. Um, you know, trout trails is another informational program. If you're interested in, in targeting trout, gives you some really good opportunities. Um, you know, and, and information to to you know go all around the state and target trout. So, just just because it is such a diverse um, fishery and resource that we manage, we try to make that information available and um, you know so that people have access to it and and can follow up on it. So, I, I guess that would be my my parting thought there. Well, Jimmy, thank you very much for being with us today. 
Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Absolutely. Jim Francis, the Lake Erie Basin Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources here on the Megacast. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll shift gears from fishing to business, and we'll join our friends over in Berkeley with the Berkeley Era Chamber of Commerce. That coming up next here on the Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Erica Jones in the studios of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM, our flagship TV and radio stations here on the Oakland County Megacast family of TV, radio, and online outlets all throughout the Oakland County area. And as uh, society begins to reopen here in the local area throughout the state of Michigan and restrictions have been lifted, our business community starts its recovery phase and that is not limited to any one area that's all throughout Oakland County in the state of Michigan and including in the in the in the Berkeley area as well. We're pleased, pleased to be joined now by Darlene Rotham. She is the executive director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. Darlene, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Glad so, to be here. So how are you and how's the team over at the Berkeley Chamber of Commerce? We're we're doing great. We're <clears throat> thrilled that uh, things are opening up again and uh, moving forward with uh, events and our businesses, people coming in and uh, visiting, shopping, uh, eat, dine, entertainment, and um, things, are, things are on the horizon going forward. So Darlene, coming out, of, out from under the restrictions <coughs> such as the capacity limits, the mask mandates and so on, uh, these businesses had about nine days fewer than what was expected with the previous uh, my vax to normal plan, which would reopen the state and the state's economy outside of these restrictions on July 1st. How did that affect their adjustments and, and their preparations? Were they able to make that in time uh, to, to really kick off strong when things reopened here in the state? Um, the businesses have tried to monitor and try and stay one step ahead, hoping that things were going to be opening up at some, at some point soon. So I think they've used their time wisely to prepare. So even with it opening up, um, most of them jumped on it as, as fast as possible and were thrilled to be able to um, move forward sooner. For, for most businesses, but particularly for restaurants, the capacity limits with the restrictions in place that were really having taking the biggest yeah. toll business-wise yeah. throughout the pandemic. And so Darlene, as businesses are reopening, we're of course have in the middle of a staffing crisis as well. How has that affected these businesses, particularly the restaurants and their ability to go back to full capacity? Are they at that point yet? 
it's challenging. I mean, they, um, as far as running their business, they're, they know what they're doing and they're doing great. The um, staffing is the biggest problem um, that, they're, that they're all having. Some of had to adjust their hours accordingly. Um, I know sometimes, you know, they might have to change days that they might have even been open to adjust to it. But for the most part, they're really trying to keep open as much as possible. Um, some have gone to having outside seating that they previously might not have had. And, and um, the city of Berkeley opened up opportunities for them to um, make exceptions on the fly. And that has helped them immensely. Um, because there's still a lot of people who don't want to eat inside. Uh, so there, whoever could put outside seating has put outside seating there. Um, they're just, you know, and clearly their costs of doing business have gone up. Um, just the food that they're buying, the time frame of getting things, you know, that's another staffing problem, getting the food, the raw food to them, you know, is, is an, another side of the uh, staffing situation. But they, they're they all trying to stay one step ahead of the game and the city is trying to, you know, open the doors to whatever opportunities they can to make that easier. Um, it would help everyone across the nation, of course, if the staffing situation could be more full. Darlene Rothman joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the executive director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. And, and Darlene, let's, let's going back to uh, going back to the uh, situation with Berkeley, providing some exceptions for outdoor seating for some of these mm -hmm. restaurants. Earlier on in the pandemic, we saw a lot of those exceptions being made in many municipalities, but especially in areas that do have more of a walkable community, whether that be in local areas here like Kego Harbor in our main coverage area, but also in walkable communities and the busier walkable yeah. communities generally like Berkeley, Royal Oak, Ferndale, Birmingham, and so on. Are those are those exceptions that have been made by these municipalities, or in, in this case, in Berkeley specifically, does the Chamber of Commerce expect those to be continued even after the pandemic, albeit maybe not in as much as great of a capacity as it has been during this emergency? We are having strong conversations about that, um, and clearly, carry out in the last year and a half has kept a lot of businesses afloat that weren't that don't have the opportunities to do outside dining just because of uh, restrictions on where their property is, things like that. Carry out has been an enormous factor to help all of those. Um, yes, there are conversations to extend. The immediate is to extend out the exceptions for a year. And we're actually starting the conversation of it being much more than a year, but um, they're looking into feasibility studying of what the situations are so that there's a more permanency to it. So those conversations have already begun very seriously and um, we're hoping that it changes the landscape of how uh, the restaurants are in the community. So especially Berkeley. On the conversation of carry out with restaurants, I know in the real heat of the pandemic, a lot of restaurants had exceptions where you could even take alcoholic beverages to go with you, which is a lot of times something that you're mm -hmm. not able to do Social at restaurants. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. So how does that look moving forward? Was that completely just a situational thing? Or do you think we're going to be seeing more of that as we move forward with being able to get a cocktail and take it to go with you if you don't finish it? I haven't heard that specific topic discussed in Berkeley. Um, I know certainly there are, were businesses that were um, doing that, where they were pairing up a bottle of wine recommendation for the foods that were going out or cocktails. I haven't heard that that stopped. So I believe that that's continued because again, there's a lot of people are more comfortable being out in public, um, eating indoors, but there's still a lot that aren't in the carry out business is strong. So I, I can't say officially that that has been extended, but I would guess it, it is at this point. We're joined by Darlene Rothman on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the executive director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. And uh, 
as, as things are coming back to normal, and so, we're also seeing many of these traditions that unfortunately had to be canceled or postponed or done away with during the pandemic start to come back as well. And that includes Berkeley's Street Art Fest, which was canceled last year due to COVID-19. It's gonna take place this year. It yes. will take place on August 7th. What can people expect at this year's Street Fest? Um, well, as each week goes by, we're able to bring more back than we thought we might when we had the discussion in February about bringing it back. Um, we are thrilled that uh, it's uh, event is approved and it's it started as a, a chalk contest and that's still the essence of what the Berkeley Street Art Fest is. And it is for all different levels of artists to, to they purchase a chalk square. There is a contest and there's different levels for the contest. Um, and then uh, there's semi-professional people that come to participate. This year we're highly encouraging um, families to participate, people in the community to participate. Over the last year and a half, even with all of us walking, I was doing a lot of walking. I saw a lot of people doing chalk in on their sidewalk at their home. And so it's become something that people were doing at home. And so we really are encouraging that aspect of the Street Art Fest. Um, in addition to the, the people who have uh, become chalk artists in their writing, and most of them do it as like a side thing. Not, uh, not all of them do it as professional chalk artists. Although David Zinn has been one of our uh, key feature artists. Um, I don't know for sure yet if we, you know, we had to change the date of the event. It was normally in July, now it's August. So we're in conversation with David Zinn. Um, he, if you Google um, chalk artists in Michigan, 90% uh, of what you see will be David Zinn. And we actually have two of his permanent drawings in Berkeley. And he might be doing a, a permanent one uh, two days before the event. And those details are being worked out. What's new this year is we are having a Shop for Good event also. It's the first of its kind in Michigan. And this is uh, vendors who a component of their the wares that they sell is is going to the good. Um, Vitrine is a store in Berkeley that um, Susan, who is the owner, is very involved herself with um, vendors that are doing things for good. Not all of her vendors are doing that, but she works with a lot of these people throughout the year. She works with um, third world countries that they're helping out. So all of the vendors for the shop for good, um, we are actually looking uh, to put the word out about artists that have that component. Uh, clearly the turnaround of this event revolving is in a shorter time frame than in the past years. Um, so if there's artists that are looking to participate, um, they can sign up right now at uh, berkeleystreetartfest.com website. Um, so some of them are tied in with social issues. Some are uh, fair trade artists. Some help uh, people that are at risk or underprivileged and um, they're helping, they're uh, ones that are helping locally and globally. So this is a different kind of component of the street art fest that we didn't have before. Um, and we specifically have artists in, in the shop for good in that, in that special, special uh, genre, because on September 11th, we have our other major event in Berkeley, which is uh, the uh, art bash and that has been going on for I believe about 20 years and those have a separate set of artists so we're not competing with our own event with similar artists that would be going to that, that event and that sign up's already live also so we will have um, music um, there's a new business called Pinspiration on Coolidge that is going to be doing outside um, 
program uh, geared, I believe, more towards kids. So um, any of our businesses that have can have people come in, they're welcome to do. We obviously want the Coolidge in Berkeley will be closed that day for this event. So the chalk artists are right in the street. The uh, Shop for Good is right in the street. We're going to have um, food trucks and food vendors out there. So it's really a family friendly day to come out and enjoy the community and, and have fun. We're joined by Darlene Rothman on the Oakland County Megacast. She's the executive director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. And uh, um, Darlene, as, as we're getting closer to the August 7th date, how long do artists have to apply to be in the Berkeley Street Art Fest? It is live right now, and I'm looking to see. Um, they probably have a couple more weeks to sign up um, for the shop for good. I'm looking to see if there's a deadline on the site. So um, I would say um, we would be looking probably into mid-July to finalize be, um, how, the artists. And um, we also know it's a challenge for the artists because <clears throat> they didn't have any events to go to last year. And now the amount of events that they might be able to go to is now condensed into a shorter time frame. But again, this is the first time a shop for good um, uh, situation is actually happening in Michigan. So um, we like to appeal to those artists that really have that extra dimension of doing things for a cause that's or helping like a third world countries, something that has that really where it's helping for good um, component. And that's a growing uh, appeal for artists um, to be doing what they do, but also helping others. We're joined by Darlene Rothman on the Oakland County Megacast. She's the executive director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. The Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce holding their Street Art Fest. It's returning on August 7th. That'll be on a Saturday from 11 a.m. until 5 p.m. And Darlene, anything else you'd like to discuss or anything else interesting happening in Berkeley that our audience should know about? Uh, well, I mentioned also the uh, Art Bash, which is uh, September 11th. Uh, we also have Cruise Fest, which is the day before the Woodward Cruise, which is in August. And that is, um, uh, if anyone's interested, they register through the Parks and Rec to be, it's a parade of about 400 cars. And that's been very popular. Uh, clearly didn't happen last year, but this is the 25th anniversary for Cruise Fest. Um, we're actually going to have a, a t-shirt for that, that we always have a t-shirt for the Cruise Fest and those have become collector's items, but this one will be certainly one because it's the 25th anniversary. Um, there's also a few uh, ladies nights out that are happening. There's one happening in July and um, that's through the uh, Berkeley DDA. Um, things are just happening all over the place. Um, one of the things that we're doing different because we always want people to come from all over to participate in the Berkeley Street Art Fest, but uh, everyone has become more in tune with their own community and supporting their community. So another aspect of the Street Art Fest is we are actually going to have yard signs that uh, people can purchase showing that they're supporting the event, but it's also a way of getting uh, themselves and their neighbors involved in, in uh, coming to this family friendly event. And even though there's a part of it's a contest, most people are doing it because it's a great outlet to have fun. And, and really that's what it is. It's a fun day to spend in Berkeley. And there's a lot of businesses that um, maybe not everyone knows about. And this is a, a great day to come this day and any of our events, any day to come. And there's also murals that are uh, started from the Street Art Fest that um, there's several of them in Berkeley will be pointing out where you can see them. I'm actually in one of the facilities called Folio Offices and there's three murals in the back and they're 
we're looking to hopefully have another one painted here this year. So there's things to see um, throughout and we certainly obviously support the arts. Again, the Berkeley Street Art Fest returns to downtown Berkeley on August 7th from 11 a.m. until 5 p.m. Uh, Darlene, thank you very much for joining us today. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Darlene Rothman joining us. She is the executive director of the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. We're going to take another quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast before we head into the second hour of the show. Of course, you're listening to us on our radio homes, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. That's 88.1. The Biff, a service of the Bloomfield Hills School District. When we come back, we will talk more about the impact of the pandemic on school districts as we are coming out of the pandemic, it seems, and how these schools are preparing for school for educating this fall after COVID-19. That coming up next on the second hour of the Wednesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith alongside Erica Jones in our flagship station studios, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM here in West Bloomfield. In addition today, as always, we're on 88.1 WBFH The Biff on Birmingham Area Municipal Access, both of our TV stations, Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99. You can also find us online on civiccentertv.com and find episodes later in the day as well as full interviews from today's show in case you missed any or there's only a few specific ones that you want to tune into and maybe you tuned in a little late. Civiccentertv.com slash megacast. You can click on our watch full episodes link there or watch full interviews link on that page and see everything from today and all of our editions of the Oakland County Megacast. Now, as we're heading into the summer and we are out of the second school year affected by COVID-19. We're heading toward a fall school year that will definitely look a little bit different than things have in the past as COVID-19 has had a major impact on education and on educators all throughout our local area. And joining us to talk more about that is the new Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services at the West Bloomfield School District, Scott Long, joins us now on the Oakland County Megacast. Scott, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. How are you today? Good, good over here. How are things over on your end and over at the West Bloomfield School District? Uh, fantastic. Really excited to, to start in this new position to continue my service to the West Bloomfield School District. And um, we're excited for uh, hopefully a better fall than we had last fall and get things closer to what they were like before COVID hit. So Scott, you just you were just at the most recent school board meeting named the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services. There are several assistant superintendents in the West Bloomfield School District, all of different kinds of titles. So for those that are not familiar, what is the uh, what, what is the basic job description of the Assistant Superintendent for Learning Services? Yeah, so basically, um, like the title says, we're responsible for moving learning forward in our school district, ensuring that all of our kids are learning, that we meet them where they're at, 
so that they can be the best students and people that they can possibly be. And so whether that is supporting teachers and their growth and their development through professional development, um, supporting and coaching principals so that they can get the most out of their buildings and, and meet their goals and, and their school improvement plans, um, all that, all that it kind of falls under my responsibility. And, and the good thing is we have a great team. And one of the things I love about our school district and one of the things that really excited me about this position is even though we have um, two other assistant superintendents, we work really closely together. Um, there's no silos and that's gonna help us move our work forward even more efficiently. We're joined by Scott Long. He's the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services over at the West Bloomfield School District. Joining us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and Scott, as we're heading in, as we've headed into the summer, we're out of the first full year of the COVID-19 COVID education, but really a second year that's affected by COVID-19. As you're approaching fall learning, not knowing where we're going to be with the vaccination point, uh, with vaccinations, or if we're going to be at the herd immunity point, how is that? How is that uncertainty going into a third year, a third year of schooling with uncertainty being in the planning? How is that affecting how the school district is preparing for what's going to happen in the fall? Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the lessons that we learned from last summer is things can change on a dime, right? And I know we spent a lot of efforts early in the summer planning. And then those plans got rehashed and did some more planning as we got later. And so I think one of the big lessons that we've learned is um, let's let's wait and see what the landscape looks like as we get into planning um, so that we're the most efficient that we can possibly be and how we move into the fall. I think that's really important, especially when you think about how things have evolved. Um, and, you know, for us as educators, we never like that level of uncertainty that, you know, we like to make sure that we understand where we're going and have a very clear picture of that. But if anything, I think uh, the pandemic has taught us is that we have to learn how to be flexible and adjust to the times and in doing that make sure that we meet the needs of our kids and families uh, yeah for sure and you said hi mr long tyler we're not on a first name basis here my uh, old teacher but uh um, hi. hi congrats on your new position and all you've accomplished since i was in school wow it's been like what 10 years now but um, yeah yeah you're making me feel old oh my gosh oh, oh no Judging, I, judging by my hair, though, I mean, it's not hard to make. No, me no, I, I'm still in college. Uh, Don't worry, I'm not. I'm not an adult. Um, but anyway, so you talk about meeting the needs of families, and I know with I can't speak, but grade school, <laughs> grade school students, a lot of it is more so. I guess I don't want to use the word appease, but a little bit making the parents happy versus the kids, because with the younger kids, especially, you know, they they don't know better. Yeah, they they don't really know better or whatever especially the ones that have for the past three years been in this don't really know what life in school is like before the pandemic so with things getting better what are the responses you're hearing from parents are they happy are they concerned or are you getting feedback for what they want to see this upcoming fall just overall what are you hearing so i could i could speak you know I, most of my communications have been with the doherty community because up until last week um, that's where i was you know where my responsibilities were lied but um, one of the things that I think families are just so excited for is the fact that kids will be in school for a full day, right? Um, they didn't have that in West Bloomfield last year. We were, kids came in for a half of a day and then they could either stay for extended learning um, or go home. And so I think there's a huge level of excitement to get back to the sense of kids being in the building with us all day long, going to lunch, going to recess and having that, that true elementary experience, right? Or that true school day experience. So that's one excitement. I think one fear for families is, what do mitigation strategies look like? Will kids continue to have to wear masks in the fall? Um, what will social distancing look like? And it's it's wild because you have families that have different levels of comfort, right? And so for us, I think the number one thing is to continue to follow the guidance of the health department in terms of what they recommend with those mitigation strategies um, and also being as responsive as possible to the community. Because I think it, in this context, it's impossible to make every single person extremely happy because everyone has different feelings about that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it's super challenging, but do you have any answers to those questions? Do you know if kids are going to have to wear masks or what social distancing will look like, any of that? Well, I can tell you right now, uh, based on the most re recent guidelines that the health department put out, well, we're continuing to wear masks in our summer school programs right now. Um, that's based on you know what the health department has recommended. Um, we're continuing to social distance as much as possible. Um, our social distancing with summer school, because the numbers are a little bit lower, um, we're able to have that six feet of, of distance in terms of kids in the classrooms. Um, so, you know, that's where we're at right now. 
where we'll be um, when September hits, I can't, I don't have the definitive answer because, you know, I'm not the health department, right? But I mean, um, we, you can, it, there's a good chance that we can anticipate based on how things have gone that masks might still be needed, right? Um, the number one thing we want to do is make sure that kids are safe um, and, you know, staff is safe and that everyone feels comfortable coming to school. We're joined by Scott Long here on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services for the West Bloomfield School District. And, and Scott, as we are approaching that school, that school year in the fall, and as we are getting closer to that, we, we gotta look back as well, because we, we recently had another educator on who, has, who, who very astutely said, school is not gonna be what it was before the pandemic. It, educating is the way, educating, the education system that was in place pre-pandemic is gone. It's not coming back. It's going to be completely different. This has been a paradigm change in education. How is that going to affect the school district, particularly on, on the side of virtual learning? Because for some, distance learning or virtual learning has been seen as the best way to educate their child or the best system for their child. How is that being considered as plans are being made for the fall? Well, that's a great question. So one of the things that we'll continue doing um, that came about as a result of the pandemic was our Lakers online program, which gives students the opportunity to learn virtually at home um, in a mix of asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities, um, some, some great chances for self-paced learning. And so for families that want that fit, they're going to have that opportunity, which I think is super exciting. I think for us, for, for the in-person educators and in-person students, I think one of the biggest challenges is we're in this fork in the road, right? So whenever you talk about going back to a full day of school and you think about all the different things that we changed and experimented and learned over the last year and a half is how do we continue to innovate and move forward um, and challenge ourselves as opposed to falling back to what's comfortable because it, for the sake of comfort, right? And so I think for us as educators this year, continuing to push ourselves and stretch um, what we believe what we understand education to be and what education can be with always understanding like the number one thing is how do we personalize learning for kids and get kids excited about learning and offer them opportunities that um that students previously haven't had the chance to to receive right so i think that's really important to consider yeah so you said a lot of families people are really excited to be able to be back in a full day of school but i think back when i was in grade school i would have killed for wow any day off Tyler I'm sure you too you know sure. it's like having a million snow days in a row but you get to a point when it's for three years in a row that are the kids also like wow we want to be in school or are they still enjoying the time off like how do they kind of fall into things do they look at it like a three-year snow day or do they want to be back more as much as their parents want them to be back everybody wants People, we want the value of connection. We want to be able to connect with people and interact with people and have a sense of belonging. And I think when you know you talk about being gone and, and being remote and only being able to connect with, with people through a computer, I think that sense of belonging and connectedness slips away and, and you long for that, right? And so there, what I found to be the case is this renewed sense of appreciation for not having to come to school, but getting to come to school not having to show up to a class, but having getting this opportunity to interact with people and learn from other people and have this face-to-face -face experience. I think that has been so powerful for us to remember how grateful that grateful we should be for those opportunities. And so, no, I think there's no, there's no sense of reluctance of coming back. I remember when we did have to do a little pause in the middle of the year this year, um, kids were so bummed to find that out. And when they came back, they came back with an even more renewed fervor for, for wanting to learn. And so I think it's really put that piece into perspective, right? Um, like, hey, yeah, I get to miss a day of school versus uh, we, get to, we get to be here. We're joined by Scott Long on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services at the West Bloomfield School District. And as plans are being made for the fall, as those discussions are being made at the, are being had at the administrative level, we've seen previously in the pandemic, there was a lot of input that was received and, and looked for and sought after by the West Bloomfield School District from parents and from students alike. Is that something that's going to be uh, commonplace in the planning this summer heading into a fall that's going to be very different than the beginnings of school, school years of the past? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. We're going to be looking for the voices of our, our community members and the voices of our students because that's who we serve, right? And their their level of, of comfort and their, their feeling of safety, psychological safety and physical safety, um, their hopes, their passions, their dreams for themselves as students and for parents, their kids, like that's super important to us. That's why we come to school every single day. That's why we do what we do, right? So you could expect us continuing to, to solicit and, and get input from families about what their hopes are and, and what they think that we should consider. Absolutely. Scott Long with us, the new assist, assistant superintendent of learning services at the West Bloomfield School District. And uh, keeping that in mind, keeping the input of these families in mind as we're heading back in to the school year next year, Scott, um, because these families have had to to uh, have this input previously, uh, and we've seen the impact that the COVID nineteen pandemic has had on ed on educating and on edu we've also seen it be had on educators. And so, as we're heading into the, to the fall, with what we've seen over the course of the pandemic, with so many teachers that were in education having either left the profession or taken early retirement, is there any concern within the West Bloomfield School District regarding? retaining teachers going into the fall, knowing that it's gonna be not necessarily the same challenge that we've seen them have over the course of the pandemic, but a new challenge that, that is gonna arise as we educate in the fall post COVID-19. That's a great question. And I think about it like the, the previous question about students, right? Um, when all of a sudden they, they lost that opportunity to come to school, they have this renewed appreciation for being able to be there. And what I've noticed about our staff is the thing that I keep hearing over and over again is we're so excited to be back and with the kids on a regular basis and a full day experience. And the, the teachers in West Bloomfield are absolutely amazing. They're inspirational and they have done more than I could ever have imagined to, to move learning forward and to support kids. And there's a very positive vibe from our staff and there's a very powerful sense of excitement moving forward. So there's not really a lot of fear for us in terms of not being able to retain teachers. And I think that's a huge credit to um, how our families have supported our teachers and how they've showed their appreciation for them, um, how our teachers have taken care of each other and what our teachers are really all about. We're joined by Scott Long on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services at the West Bloomfield School District. Scott, just another couple minutes with you here before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, if people want to provide their input, if parents, if students, uh, if teachers would like to provide their input to the school district as these plans are being made, as preparations are being made for fall, however it looks, how can they best go about doing that? Yeah, so we'll create some appropriate platforms and channels as we uh, get a little bit deeper into the summer for that feedback, just so it's streamlined as much as possible. Um, so they can stay tuned for that and keep an eye out on our website and through you know district communication. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then obviously, um, if any families wanna reach base with me, they can email me. My email is super easy. It's scott.long at wbsd.org. Um, if they wanna just connect, have a conversation, um, want to share anything that we think that they think right now we need to know about. So that's, that's a really easy way to do that. Scott, anything else that you believe would be important for our audience to know or anything else interesting uh, from the West Bloomfield School District to keep an eye out for this summer? Uh, you know, I think the most important thing I'd like to say is a, a huge thank you to our teachers and our educators in our community. Uh, you, you make things happen in our school district, so I appreciate that. I want to thank our families for all the support they've given us over this crazy last year and a half. And I, I want to let all of our families know that we are so excited to move into this upcoming school year. I cannot wait to invest in your, your kids and um, your families and do the very best by you so that we can help kids learn and, and be proud and excited to come to school every single day. Well, Scott, we thank you very much for joining us on today's show. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Scott Long, the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services at the West Bloomfield School District with us on the Oakland County Megacast. With that, we'll take another quick break. And when we come back, we will shift from education to the arts and be joined by the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. That coming up next on the Oakland County Megacast. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get vaccinated? I'd like to go to these school dances and spring break to have fun. I want to be in person for college next semester. I want to get out of this pandemic. I wanted to protect the people around me. Why did you get vaccinated? 
because I'm really looking forward to hanging out with my friends. I just want to go to a show, dance around, not have to worry about anything, feel like I'm free again. So we can not miss out on the best years of our life. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith alongside Erica Jones here in our Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM studios, our flagship stations here each and every day on the Oakland County Megacast. For those of you joining us for the first time, you can find us Monday through Friday live, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, here on 89.3 Lakes FM, on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, as well as online on civiccentertv.com and on Facebook, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. Well, in, in normal times and during a, a pandemic, something that people turn to often for, um, for uh, creative time, for something fun to do, for a, for a hobby, or uh, even for a profession is art. And we are pleased to be joined now by the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center, Joy Dockham, joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. Joy, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. How are you and how's the team over at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center? Well, I mean, obviously it has been a very interesting and challenging year, but um, we are excited to have made it through this last year and to be moving forward and now being able to host exhibits and things like that. We're excited about it. For those that aren't familiar, what is the Pontiac Creative Arts Center? What do you do? It's an organization that's actually been around since 1964. Um, Dr. Furlong, I'll give you a little quick bit of history of local history. Uh, Dr. Furlong was the only Michigan um, military personnel during World War I to win a Medal of Honor. And then he came home, he joined um, the National Guard and ended up going back as a surgeon during World War II. And in the middle, he got his, um, he got his medical degree from University of Michigan. And so he was an OBGYN in Pontiac for like 50 years. And so as he was ending his years as a doctor, he, um, in conjunction at the time with the city of Pontiac, they opened the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. So we've been around for a while, um, but sometimes we're a little too good of a secret, if that makes sense. And so we've been really working on letting people know we're here and what we can offer the community. So what is offered? What are some of the programs or the special exhibits that are offered over time at the Pontiac Creative Arts Center? What we do normally during a typical year is we will have exhibits every 
eight, six to eight weeks, we will change an exhibit. It will have a particular theme. Um, it may focus on um, a particular group of folks. Um, it, may fo it may, or a particular type of art. Uh, we usually have those, like I said, every six to eight weeks. And then we also offer clubs and classes. So for example, the things that we are coming up first, this summer, because we weren't sure what COVID restrictions would be when we were making our plans, um, we are doing a pop exhibit, which is, it stands for um, Peas of Pontiac. And literally artists have decorated the letter P in all kinds of ways. I mean, I can't even explain the uniqueness of them. And so we've been taking it on the road. The next place that we're going to is the summer social at the Oakland History Center in July on the 24th and 25th, we'll be there. And then we'll also have, if you are a community person that would like to decorate your own pea and add to the exhibit, we'll have those for you to decorate. And then we also run clubs. Right now we have a fiber arts club, a clay club, which is ceramics and a photography club. And then we are working on growing those. And currently are those programs and those clubs that are in place, are they currently happening in person or have they been happening virtually over the course of the pandemic? They've been virtual over the last year. Play Club will start in about two weeks in person and then we are planning to continue that into August and September that everything will be, um, you can come in person and then we're also going to try to offer an online component for folks that either due to health or maybe they're just not quite ready to be in a group of strangers yet. We're joined by Joy Dockham on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. And Joy, over the course of the pandemic, you mentioned you had some virtu you've had virtual programs that have persisted throughout the pandemic and may continue on after the pandemic. But in terms of the exhibits and pr providing uh, this level of, a, of an ability for artists to showcase their work here in the local area, how has that continued on throughout the pandemic? Because a lot of the a lot of art viewing is tangible. It's being there in person. It's seeing the textures. It's mm -hmm. seeing the different forms of art that you just can't really get virtually. It was it was tricky and scary, if you want the truth. Um, we were not sure at first, because at first, you know, we all thought this might be a shorter period of time than it was. So we had just put up an exhibit. It was called Pathways, and it was an exhibit featuring um, Middle Eastern artists, and that was March of, of 2020. So we took that one when we realized we were not gonna be able to reopen. We went ahead and got a virtual exhibit um, and put that online. Then it got harder because that was very time consuming and it's hard to engage people in that way. So um, we were able to do another exhibit and this I think we kind of fine tuned a little bit more by February. We did, we always do a big African-American artist um, exhibit in February and this year we were able to have online components. We had we did a poetry component. We did um, like some people doing other art, other types of art that weren't just like here's a portrait or here's um, something that's hanging on a wall. And so we were able to kind of focus on different forms of art that were a little easier to put on video than just to walk around the room looking at pictures. We're joined by Joy Dockham. She is the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center here on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and Joy, this organization, it is a, a, is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, so, um, most of, so, so most of the funding for this, or the, entirely the funding for this, comes from donations. How did that persist over the course of the pandemic? And, and is this an organization that's having some struggles right now, as many have, because donations were down over the course of the pandemic due to the financial struggles that so many people had to deal with? It was um, very difficult, especially the first few months, because all revenue essentially was drying up. We do have a little bit of money that um, Dr. Furlong had set a trust up. So we are allowed, and it's all based on like how much interest is the trust makes in money each month. And we get a small amount, but it's like enough to keep like lights and heat on. It's not enough to pay people and, and pay for programming. So we just, I think did a, what a lot of nonprofits did. We just scrambled and figured out how to keep the doors open. Um, as the year went on, grants became available and we were able to get grants through um, both Oakland County and the state of Michigan and some federal money. Um, so we just kept like month by month, like, okay, we're going to be okay this month. Okay, let's figure out what we can do this month. How can we engage the community? How can we still provide art to people? We did a lot of, um, we started a program we called Create at Home, which started with um, brown bag art kits where um, 
twice a month on the second and the fourth of the month, Monday at 10 a.m. There are art kits on our front porch that families can come just pick up for their kids, they're free. Then we started uh, uh, taking um, clay club. You could come get the art kit and then bring it back and we would fire it for you and you could come pick up your pottery. So we just started rolling with the situation and you know, letting people know here, we're still here. We still care about the community. We still want to help. And um, we kind of figured if we could just get through the summer, then we would be all right. And um, fingers crossed, I think we're going to make it through the summer. Well, we have our fingers crossed over here for you, most definitely. Um, <laughs> Thank clearly you. Clearly, you're doing some fantastic things. But what would you say makes the Pontiac Creative Arts Center different and unique from maybe some other communities' creative arts centers? <sighs> I think every art center is going to take on the personality of the community and the people. Um, I think, I mean, we are not necessarily, we're not DIA, okay, but we're not trying to be. We're trying to meet another niche. My goal is to sort of have art available at whatever level you enjoy it. If you enjoy coming and looking at the exhibits with sculptures and paintings, fantastic, we have a spot for you. If you want to take a class, to learn how to take better um, pictures with your iPhone, we'd like to have you come for that. Uh, sort of, we wanna meet people where they're at, not expect them to be something for us. So I think that's something that makes us unique. Whatever your impression of art is, we've probably got something you will enjoy. We're joined by Joy Dockham on the Oakland County Megacast. She's the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. And, and Joy, as you mentioned, you have a number of classes, some that are uh, virtual and some that are going to be in person or will continue to be in person at this time and right now what are some of those programs that are available and how can people get involved in these programs do they have to uh, sign up for them early or can they join them kind of in progress if they're already occurring you can pretty much join anytime you want um, <clears throat> this fall we will have some specific classes for instance on this last Sunday we did a indigo dye workshop which I had never done that and it was really fun, actually. Um, I was nervous I wouldn't do it right, but it was, you don't need to be nervous about trying new things in art. You need to just come and have fun. Um, so those are posted on our website. So if you go to um, Pontiac Arts with an S org, you will be able to access the upcoming classes and the clubs, and that will continue to be updated as new things are scheduled for the fall. Um, and then, so we have two dye workshops coming up, also different classes, one in one July 18th and one August 15th. And then our Create at Home program is still running as well as, well, yoga will start again, probably about the middle of August. Uh, Fiber Arts Club and Clay Club will both continue. And you can join at any time. You can join for one month. You can join for a class. You're, there is no commitment. Just come and have fun with us. Enjoy. are these classes available to anyone or are they specifically just to members or is there, is there a mix of both? Everything is involved in, um, is welcome to everyone. Okay. And so for those that, but, but people can continue while they're taking these classes to support the Pontiac Creative Arts Center through membership and, and through donations. Is there, is there one or the other? Can they make just a simple donation if people want to donate to an organization like yours or do they have to become a member in order to make those donations? No, anyone is welcome to donate whatever they would like. Um, sometimes people, and, and I think of donations as more than just money. If you have time, if you have, um, if you have a particular skill, we're always looking for instructors to offer um, interesting classes. If there's a skill you have you'd like to share with others, we would be interested in talking with you. So, I mean, I look at donations in whatever way they come. We are excited about them. Yeah, and so, yeah, that, that was my next question was, is it just money or is it also time? So for those that do have some expertise in art or do have some skills that they would uh, be able to teach other people or lead some of these classes or help them out, how can they best get in contact with the Pontiac Creative Arts Center to volunteer their time? The best way is to email. If you just email office at PontiacArtsWithAnS.com, I get those emails. And um, I would be happy to speak with them on what they are interested in sharing. Joy Dockham joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. She's the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. And Joy, there's always a lot of events going on. You said every six to eight weeks or so uh, in normal times, you would have a new exhibit that would be filing through the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. So what are some of these upcoming events that are being held by the Arts Center, both in person and virtually as we're heading through the summer? 
The first thing that we've got coming up is a called Fuel for the Soul. And it is a car art exhibit that will open up during um, the Pontiac Dream Cruise. The first opening of it will be August 21st from one to five. And um, that is going to focus primarily on cars of the 50s and 60s, although there will be memorabilia and art from earlier times as well. Um, and that we are partnering with the Pontiac Transportation Museum for that exhibit. We will um, have in November, we will have the pop, uh, kind of the final closing of the exhibit. Um, we, like I said before, we've been traveling a couple of different places during the summer, but we will host a final closing of that exhibit in November. And then in December, we are going to do part fundraiser, part exhibit. We have been collecting crazy, uh, like holiday Christmas type sweaters, and we're going to auction them off. They'll be displayed as art, and then they'll be auctioned um, for money to raise for the center. We're joined by Joy Dockham, the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center, with us on the Oakland County Megacast. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization located uh, in Pontiac. And, and Joy, as we're going forward and we're coming out of this pandemic, we've seen the impact that art has had on people throughout the pandemic, whether it be therapeutic or professional, whatever the case may be. Why is art in an organization like yours so important to the community, particularly in Pontiac, but even beyond that, just in the local area? I think it is a place to connect. Um, we live in a world that sometimes becomes very virtual. Even and this last year was such a, such an exper extreme of that. And I think sometimes something that will bring us together is is the beauty of art. And like I said, sometimes people think art is only you know if it's a Van Gogh or it's you know some other well known famous artist. But really, it can be something you did with your family or you did with a friend, and it brings that memory and a connection with another person. Joy Dockham with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center. And Joy, just another couple of minutes with you before we'll have to say goodbye today. Is there anything else that you'd like to discuss about the Pontiac Creative Arts Center? Or anything that would be interesting or important for our audience to know today? I think just that we'd love to have you come and visit. Um, and I think one of the great things about us is we're not locking you into anything. You can come for a class, you can come for an exhibit, you can just come to poke your head in and say hello one day. Um, we would love to have the opportunity to meet you and get to know you in whatever ways you're interested in your art. Well, Joy, we thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was very enjoyable to speak with you. Absolutely. Joy Dockham with us on the Oakland County Megacast, the director of the Pontiac Creative Arts Center with us today on the show. We're going to take a quick break and just about 20 or so minutes left in today's edition of the Megacast. When we come back, we will focus on another organ local organization doing great work here in Oakland County. We'll speak with the executive director and the founder of Oakland Hope. That is coming up next on the Oakland County Megacast. Joy, great Who job. is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MyCal or chat online at michigan.gov slash MyCal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. And most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance. They may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking 
longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get vaccinated? I'd like to go to these school dances and spring break to have fun. I want to be in person for college next semester. I want to get out of this pandemic. I wanted to protect the people around me. Why did you get vaccinated? Because I'm really looking forward to hanging out with my friends. I just want to go to a show, dance around, not have to worry about anything, feel like I'm free again. So we can not miss out on the best years of our life. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Erica Jones in our Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM studios here in the greater West Bloomfield area. As always, you can join us also on Birmingham Area Municipal Access and 88.1 WBFH, the BIF in the Birmingham Bloomfield area, as well as online civiccentertv.com and on facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash Lakes FM each and every day here from 10 a.m. to 12 noon during our live shows and throughout the week, the week for replays on Civic Center TV and on our website as well. Well, during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, so many people that previously maybe may have never struggled with food insecurity or other issues related to poverty here in our local area found themselves dealing with these issues due to the financial constraints of the COVID-19 pandemic. But, and there's a local organization that is doing their part to help these people and others throughout our local area uh, navigate that tough situation and provide them with the necessities that all of us sometimes take for granted. And that organization is Oakland Hope. We're joined now by its founder and executive director, Norma Okonski, here on the Oakland County Megacast. Norma, thank you for being with us today. Good morning. Thank you for the invite. Good morning. How are you and how's the team over at Oakland Hope? Well, you know, nothing great happens by one person. It happens with a team of people. And uh, we have a fabulous team at Oakland Hope. Over the course of the pandemic, of course, Oakland Hope's been doing great work in our community for a long time. But during the pandemic, we saw a lot more people begin to have those struggles that Oakland Hope has continued to help others navigate for years. How did that impact your organization, its operations, and its ability to fulfill the needs of so many people in our community? Wow, that's a loaded question. Oh, yeah. uh, it was just such unprecedented times for everyone, including Oakland Hope. I believe we were the only food pantry that did not close during the pandemic. Uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, we have been the little engine that could. Uh, we went from being uh, a major player in the food space to being the biggest player in the food space. Uh, during the pandemic and currently, we are uh, serving 7,000 people a month receive free groceries through Oakland Hope, which is amazing. And uh, what's more amazing is it's done with volunteers and it's also more than just shelf stable food. You know, many pantries uh, give shelf stable food, which is awesome. And that means the things that can sit on a shelf, uh, peanut butter, jelly, uh, cereal, uh, breads, uh, canned goods, those sorts of things. We also give many boxes of those things, but we have 26 coolers and freezers of milk, cheese, eggs, um, yogurt, hummus, salads, fruits, vegetables, and five or six different kinds of meat. So traditionally through COVID, uh, people have been walking out with about 80 to 110 pounds of food on a weekly basis. We're joined by Norma Okonski. She's the founder and executive director of Oakland Hope with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And, and as the pandemic has gone on, how have the needs of people that you have served changed? Because everybody's situation is different. 
and you're working to not only serve people that you had been normally serving before the pandemic, but also a variety of people that have seen the need for their for your services arise due to COVID-19? Good question. Uh, there are still so many folks who come in that are immune compromised. While most of the world is winding down their COVID precautions, we still have a number of people that come in with gloves and with masks on. And so we are still offering our Friday food drive through. And also we offer our parking lot to gleaners twice a month. Uh, so those people who cannot come in or choose not to come in can do the drive through and still receive fresh and nutritious food. So there is a variety of people um, who come to us with a variety of needs. You know, there are many people who are just getting back to work who still need a hand up with their groceries. And then that allows them to uh, use that money perhaps for a utility bill or a car repair. So we have uh, filled the need for a lot of people here temporarily or on an ongoing basis. And on the topic of filling needs, you mentioned that Oakland Hope is the only food pantry that was never or was able to keep its doors open throughout the course of the whole pandemic what do you think gave you the ability to do that or yeah what do you think gave you the ability to do that through the whole pandemic uh our fabulous volunteers uh you know we we kicked into high gear uh right before michigan state i i believe was the first you know uh university to close but we kicked into high gear with precautions right away uh, until no, more was known about the pandemic. We wore hairnets, we wore clear garbage bags over our clothing, we wore, you know, uh, Playtex gloves up to our wrists and our, our elbows. And because not enough was known about COVID and, and how uh, transmittable COVID, COVID was. And so we went through every precaution in order to bring food to the, to the families. We're joined by Norma Okonski on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She's the founder and executive director of Oakland Hope. And, and Norma, so many people are looking to help right now. Even, even as we're coming out of the pandemic, so many people during the pandemic and in current times are looking to help people in their community because they know that a lot of people have been affected by what we've gone through over the last 15 months plus. Right now, what is the most important thing? What is the number one need right now for organizations like yours to be able to, con to continue to serve people who are in need in our local community? Awesome. Well, you know, we're all affected because we're all connected. And uh, our greatest need really is money. Um, because when people do a food drive for us, that's great. But they're going to their local Meyer or their local store and spending 89 cents on a can. We go out on the commodities market and I can get three cans of those green beans for 89 cents. So if you're looking uh, for a way to leverage those dollars, uh, we can do that. And so that really is is the best need that we have right now. Much like what was mentioned in our previous interview with the Pontiac Creative Arts Center, there's many ways to donate and to provide for organizations like yours, not just monetary, but also volunteers. How, how right now, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic and things are opening back up and people maybe are getting a little more comfortable, how is the volunteer base at Oakland Hope sustaining itself at this point in time? Well, by the grace of God, uh, we have volunteers every day. Some days our volunteers are sparse uh, and other days we're blessed with a full house of volunteers. It's really easy to sign up. You just go to our website, oaklandhope.org, click the volunteer now tab, and that takes you to our sign up genius site. And then you just pick the date that works for you. Uh, so if you would feel more comfortable wearing gloves and a mask, we welcome you to do so. We have hand sanitizer at every station and so whether it's for a volunteer or for a client coming in the food pantry or a shopper in our thrift store, uh, we welcome everyone and we will provide uh, the precautions should they choose. We're joined by Oakland, Count, by Oakland Hope founder and executive director Norma Okonski here on the Oakland County Megacast uh, talking about her organization's work to provide for many people in need in our community uh, during this crisis that we've been dealing with and as we come out of this as well in terms of volunteer volunteers and volunteer opportunities where are the needs right now and how can people expect when they do sign up either for the uh, opportunities at food pantry or at thrift stores or wherever uh, the case may be what can they what is the, 
what can they expect to be the biggest need right now and where they might be best served volunteering? Well, that's awesome. Uh, folks need to be here by 1030. Uh, we have a huddle as a group, so everybody knows the needs because they change daily. Uh, sometimes people are lined up around the building for food. And so we pull people from every department to work in the food pantry. Um, when we have a lull in the food pantry, we pull those volunteers to the thrift store side of our ministry uh, in order to take care of the needs on the thrift store side. Uh, many folks, especially during the pandemic, signed up for the food pantry. But you know, we try and educate everyone. If items don't come into the thrift store, get cleaned, get priced, get put on the floor, merchandised beautifully, those items don't sell. And if those items don't sell, I don't have money that I need on a weekly basis to purchase food. So uh, both sides of the uh, ministry are very important and volunteers are always needed on both sides. Norma Okonski joins us on the Oakland County MegaCast. She is the founder and executive director of Oakland Hope. And, and looking at your website, Norm, Norma, not only does your organization provide uh, food, food pantry benefits for those that are facing food insecurities or, or extra needs to obtain basic a basic necessity such as food, You're also, your organization also provides some benefits in helping people get some of these, pro, get access to some of the programs that they need in order to sustain themselves and, and, their li and protect themselves in their lives, things like healthcare, um, whether it be MDHHS benefits, Social Security benefits, veteran benefits, and, and medi Medicaid and so on. What, what access to those services is available through Oakland Hope? And if people need those services, need that help, how can they obtain those services from your organization? That's awesome. And our benefits coordinator is something new uh, for us this year. You know, our mission is we're motivated by the love of Jesus to alleviate hunger, but also to empower lives and helping people connect to benefits is empowering their lives. There are many people who have a, a difficulty getting through the myriad of voicemails or have hearing challenges. And so our benefits coordinator, you do the same thing. You go to our website, you click uh, benefits coordinator and you can schedule an appointment with, you, with her. And her name is Amy and she will connect you, like you say, to WIC, uh, My Bridges, help with vet veterans, help with social security. And so many times it's just helping, having someone to help them through the process and then be able to connect them with benefits. So it, we really are offering a lot more wraparound services. And Norma, for those in the community that may be listening today and, and need some of the services of Oakland Hope, how can they go about uh, obtaining those services, whether it be from the food pantry or these other benefits, these other benefits, especially for people that may not have access to technology that in, in so many ways is a requirement today in <laughs> order to get access to some of these necessities. Good point. Um, and a great thing about Oakland Hope, we are right at the corner of Baldwin and Walton. So we are on the bus line for people who have, you know, transportation issues also. But another fabulous, uh, differential about Oakland Hope is we're walk-in. So you can walk in any day, Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to four and receive assistance. Our food pantry is open until three, but someone will be here until four, can connect you with Amy, uh, could walk you through the process with her, how to connect with her, capture your contact information if she's not here to make certain the two of you connect. Um, or we can walk you down and make certain that you walk out with about 80 to 100 pounds of groceries. What exactly does 80 to 100 pounds of groceries look like? Can you make that tangible? How many days, weeks of meals is that? Uh, good point. Uh, we believe 80 to 100 pounds is equal to a week's worth of family grocery shopping for four. So they walk out with at least two, if not three or four types of meat. Uh, and so they would have pastas. So there should be enough meals for one week for a family. Milk, eggs, cheese, cereal, peanut butter and jelly, salami, bologna, lunch meat. We have fish, um, you know, we have beef, we have pork, we have hot dogs and hamburger. We have uh, chicken patties, chicken nuggets, uh, whole chickens, cut up chicken. We offer pizza. So we offer a, a huge variety of items. 
Um, many people, uh, the first time in, they are astounded with how much food they've received. And then when they come in after that, they will say, you know what, perhaps I don't need as much as you gave me last time. Perhaps, you know, this could go to someone else who needs it more. So, you know, we, just like we have fabulous volunteers, our clients really um, are a good test to how much we're giving out. Um, and if they have a large family, of course, they receive more. But our goal is that it's enough to sustain them until the next week. We're joined by Norma Okonski on the Oakland County Megacast. She's the founder and executive director of Oakland Hope. And Norma, just another couple of minutes with you before we'll have to sure. say goodbye today. Is there anything else that would be important for our audience to know about Oakland Hope or any other interesting information that would be good for our audience to know today? Uh, great. Uh, we are at the corner of Baldwin and Walton, and uh, we're just uh, in the old VG's grocery store. We have a beautiful thrift store, and that is a funding mechanism for our entire ministry. So shop with us and help feed the community. Volunteer locally. Uh, make a difference in your own com community. You know, they say shop local. You can do that at Oakland Hope. Volunteer local. You can do that at Oakland Hope. And each of those activities help feed the community. In 2020, over a million and a half pounds of food moved through our facility and out into the tummies of the community. Over 82,000 people were fed in 2020. And it appears as though 2021 is going to be the very same. So uh, we're very appreciative of the support, financial, prayers, uh, and volunteers. But please know because COVID is winding down, our work here is not winding down and we still need all of those items. And again, we can't do this without the community. So thank you. Thank you very much, Norma, for joining us today. Thanks for today. Absolutely. Norma Okonski with us on the Oakland County Megacast, the founder and executive director of Oakland Hope. We're going to take one more quick break and then we'll wrap up today today's edition of the Megacast and let you know what's going on the rest of the week here on the Oakland County Megacast and as we head in to the holiday. Until then, uh, we'll take a quick break for quick messages from the station and then we'll return with more of the Oakland County Megacast on our family of TV, radio, and other media outlets. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased. So if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Erica Jones in our flagship studios here at Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Just about another minute or so left in today's show before we'll say goodbye. Just a programming note for Thursday's show. We'll be ending about five minutes early uh, tomorrow afternoon as the West Bloomfield Township Board will have a special meeting beginning at 12 noon regarding fireworks at Shenandoah Country Club coming up this weekend. And then on Friday and Monday, of Friday of this week and Monday of next week, we will be off for a long holiday weekend. We'll play some of your uh, favorite 
most recent interviews from the Oakland County MechaCast as we make a few adjustments over here as well and enjoy a long holiday weekend and a much needed break for our entire team over here at Civic Center TV and on the Oakland County MechaCast. With that, we got about 30 seconds left in the show. I'd like to thank everyone that joined us today on this edition of the MechaCast. Jim Francis from the DNR. Uh, Darlene Rothman from the Berkeley Area Chamber of Commerce. Scott Long from the West Bloomfield School District. Joy Dockham from the Pontiac Community Arts Center. And Norma Okonski from Oakland Hope. A big thank you as well to Erica Jones joining me in the, st in the studio today for today's edition of the Megacast. Our, our producer, Larry Nylon. Our booking producer, Jake Kustosh, as well, and our entire team here at the Megacast. That's going to do it for today's edition of the show. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m.